Good morning, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to the third and last bonus episode of this series on how to make a Web3D Infinite Runner game. In this episode, we're going to talk a bit about dynamically generated UI, and we'll also add some fades on our UI panels. Are you ready? Then let's dive in. Last time, we saw how to add some debug stats on our screen to help the devs. This was a brief introduction to tooling and the idea that you should think of your team as much as you do of your players. This also means that you should have a clean code base that is well readable, well organized and, if possible, pretty modular. This way, you can reuse code from one project to another and you gradually develop an internal ecosystem that gives your devs a safe and reassuring working environment. For example, in our case, we've made our best efforts to extract the JS logic in its own file, in the game class, and that allowed us to have a pretty agnostic framework that simply encapsulates and calls these inner mechanics without knowing anything about how they actually work. However, there is still one thing that the HTML index contains, although it is very project specific, and that's the UI on the screen. This means that if we were to create another game based on the same mold, we'd have to modify this index to create the proper divs, and then reference them back in the game class. This leaves a lot of room for errors. So instead, it would be better to centralize everything in the JavaScript class and have the game class handle both the creation and the update of the UI. The idea here is to generate our HTML elements dynamically. Instead of writing them by hand in our HTML index, we are going to create our divs and other HTML elements using JavaScript built-in functions and then insert them in the DOM tree. We saw a couple of tutorials ago that we can use the document.createElement built-in method to create new DOM items, and then we can use the appenchild method to actually add them into the tree. What we're going to do is create a new function in our game class, buildUI, that is called from the constructor and that prepares all the game-specific HTML elements. It will also automatically assign the DOM references, so instead of getting pre-existing divs by ID, we'll simply store them upon creation. Okay, so this is the structure that we want to reproduce. That's just everything that's in our body tag. And because it's a tree with a recursive nested structure, the idea is to first create the outer objects, so the ones that are at the root and have no parent item, add them to the body, and then create the sub-elements to add them to the newly created DOM items and recreate this hierarchy. Let's start with the info panel to see how it works. First, I'll create the outer div, so the panel itself. Note that even though I don't need an ID to retrieve it in the JS, this ID is still used by my CSS, so I do need to set it for the new element. And to set the ID, I can use either the setAttribute method or simply the ID property like this. Finally, I just need to append it to the document.bodyHTML node. At that point, I have an empty info panel, but it does take into account my stars. To populate it, it's pretty much the same. I just create a few elements of div type set their ID or their class, and append them, this time to my dynamically generated HTML info panel. I can fill in the divs with inner text or inner HTML. And for the last item, since we want an input and not a div, uh, we have to be careful to use the input tag in our document.createElement call. And then we can just use the setAttribute method to specify the type, the mean value, the max value, and the disable flag. By the way, note that append always means add in last position, so the order of the nodes in the DOM tree will depend on the order of your function calls in the JS. The intro and game over panels can be created with the exact same technique. I won't go into the details. Uh, they're actually a bit simpler, even if they require two nested levels, uh, the panel itself and the inner column div, but the rest is just similar to a previous storm generation. 
the references have automatically been assigned to, so the data is properly updated as we play through a session. Before we end this series, let's work on a last UI improvement, and that's making the panels fade instead of just disappearing abruptly like they do at the moment. The idea is basically to have an additional class on those panels, so that's the hidden class, that is toggled on or off when we want to show or hide the panel. And then we'll add some styles so that a hidden panel has an opacity of 0 and a displayed panel has an opacity of 1. We'll also add a UI transition to make the opacity gradually lerp between those values over the course of 1.5 seconds if we enable or disable the hidden class. I'll also make sure that I don't have any interactions with this panel when it's hidden. So when it's hidden, I'll just uh, disable all user interactions. And while we're at it, we can remove the specific style we added previously on the game of a panel to hide it at first, since we are now going to use a new hidden class to handle this. And to wrap this up, let's go back to the game class. And when we click on our start button or our replay button elements, we want to replace our style modification, uh, what we have now with the style that display equals something, with a class switch. And to do this, we can simply use the class list property and then add the hidden class. For the game over panel, we'll also need to initially hide it by setting the class name to contain hidden upon creation. And then we'll remove it when we run our game over logic so that the game of a panel is shown again. All right, today we've reworked our UI system to transfer everything to the game class, and we now have a very basic but very agnostic game framework that could easily be reused to create other web-based games. Everything is centralized in our JavaScript game class, and the code base is well organized to make it easier to start or maintain projects. This episode also marks the end of this series of tutorial on how to make a Web3D Infinite Runner game. I really hope you enjoyed it and that you learned a few things. Don't hesitate to react in the comments or to like and share this video and also tell me if you'd like more tutorials on web stuff like this. Thanks a lot for watching and stay tuned for new videos on tech, video games and coding.